Hello and welcome to Livewire Markets. I'm Ali Selby and today I'm sitting down for a chat with the Chief Investment Officer of MLC Asset Management, Jonathan Armitage. Thank you so much for joining me today, Jonathan. My pleasure. First off, we've seen an enormous amount of monetary and fiscal stimulus over the past 12 months. How does this impact the firepower that central banks have to combat future crises events? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I think, I mean, the first thing to say is that what we have seen in the last sort of 14, 15 months is unprecedented. Uh, and the numbers are quite staggering. In the first six weeks uh, after the sort of pandemic was really uh, sort of realized in, in America, uh, the Federal Reserve uh, put more money in that, in that first six weeks than they did in the entire GFC. So that just gives you an idea of the sort of scale. Mm. Um, I think there's sort of, the, the, the question is that with interest rates still incredibly low and still a significant amount of support in financial systems. You know, the US Federal Reserve is still buying $120 billion worth of uh, bonds every four weeks. Mm. Uh, that, that obviously leaves very little room for maneuver if, uh, if you actually see further economic weakness in two, three years time. And that's, uh, that's sort of something that I think uh, a lot of investors have got at the back of their minds. In a recent podcast, you noted that we may see more crises events than we usually would as, as, that we've seen in history. Is that true? Could you take us a little bit through that? I think it's important to remember that uh, the current sort of challenges that we've seen were very much sort of government induced, um, that we had uh, a, a completely unprecedented set of circumstances where uh, governments effectively shut down economies to deal with a medical emergency. That's sort of quite different from, uh, for example, the GFC, um, uh, the tech crash in the early 2000s, even back to sort of 1987. But those were driven by very much sort of uh, financial issues. Um, so I think it's, um, it's always very difficult to predict uh, what, what's going to sort of happen with any great, uh, great degree of certainty. And each uh, f set of financial challenges that we've seen over the last sort of 30 years has been driven by um, by different things. Um, but the, the thing that uh, I think is important at the moment is that a uh, number of asset classes evaluations look pretty full at the moment. Um, and so uh, markets are discounting quite a bit of good news, uh, particularly in terms of the, the pace of the economic recovery that we've seen really in the last six months. Let's talk a little bit about inflation. Can you take us through some of the factors informing your stance at the moment? Yeah, certainly. I mean, I think We've been talking a little bit about inflation now for sort of probably about nine months. And to be very clear, I'm not suggesting we're about to see inflation move back to the levels that we saw in uh, the 1980s. <laughs> I think our thoughts were very much that uh, inflationary expectations in markets were unbelievably low. It's almost as if inflation had been removed from financial dictionaries. Yeah. And we just sort of felt that, first of all, there was a lot of stimulus uh, in the global economy, both by central banks and also governments with a number of sort of furlough schemes that were operating not just here in Australia but in the US and, and Europe. And so governments were very determined to try and uh, get economies back onto, into some form of uh, normality, particularly when vaccines became more widely available. As you sort of see that sort of period of sort of uh, sharp rebound in economic activity, it was likely that um, inflation would pick up from very low levels. And uh, when we first started talking about this, we felt that markets were not really discounting that possibility. Mm. Now, sort of where we are currently, there's probably a number of different dynamics uh, playing out. The first one is that uh, the very strong rebound you've seen in economic activity here in Australia, but also in the US and elsewhere, um, is actually producing some shortages in certain areas. Um, there's a bit of a shortage of labour in yep. certain parts of the economy, um, also shortages as, of skilled labour. There's also uh, shortages of components in certain areas. Um, there's been a lot of coverage around, uh, globally, the shortage of semiconductor chips and that's impacting things like car production. Um, a number of those are, are likely to be quite temporary. 
although some of them seem to be taking longer to sort of um, sort out than we might have originally thought. There are some other things, though, that um, are sort of coinciding with things that we think are, are probably maybe a little bit more permanent in nature. Um, some of those skilled labour shortages um, are pushing up wage, uh, wage pressures or wage costs in, uh, for certain companies, and that's likely to be a little bit more permanent. Um, there are some other things in terms of with uh, uh, one of the outcomes of the p pandemic we think is a bit of a movement for supply chains to move from um, just in time, companies running very lean inventories um, because they could do, to probably a more just in case type of um, uh, supply chain management. So you don't just have one supplier, but you have two or three. That will push up prices, um, sort of certainly the cost of manufacturing, and we think companies will try and pass that through to their customers and that will be inflationary as well. You touched on it a little bit there, but do you see, I guess, companies moving from more a global business model to more a local model? How, you know, how has COVID-19 impacted globalisation and how is that kind of informing your view on inflation? I think one of the things that history has shown us is that when you get very sort of sharp economic events, um, they tend to accelerate some factors that were actually already present um, either in society or in the economy. Um, I think we were seeing a little bit of a rollback of globalisation um, prior to the pandemic. Uh, the most obvious way that you were seeing that was in the relationship between China and the US. Um, and those trade tensions were leading to, I think, a lot of companies re-examining, uh, first of all, their dependence on supplies from China, but also from other countries as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think what the pandemic has done is it's significantly accelerated the thinking about that. Now, for some companies, um, uh, manufacturing in different parts of the world will remain incredibly important. Um, they're global businesses and they need uh, a number of different manufacturing sites. But for other businesses, it may well be that they start to look to source things locally. Um, and that may be exacerbated if there are tariffs which are put in place, which means that it actually becomes more expensive to source things from different parts of the world than, uh, than locally. I, I think it's going to be an important dynamic um, to look at over the next two to three years. It'll take a bit of time to play out. And different businesses will be impacted in different ways. Mm. The Fed, even overnight, signalled that they still believe that inflation will only be temporary. Is there still kind of a divergence between what we're seeing in the real wor world and what central banks are saying? I think there is right now, and um, the Federal Reserve has been remarkably consistent in its sort of public comments that they do believe that the inflationary pressures are temporary and that they are prepared for inflation to be above their sort of target uh, levels, um, possibly for sort of longer than people might have anticipated beforehand, um, in part because they want to make sure that certainly the US economy is moving at uh, a sort of a, a sort of good clip um, prior to them sort of normalising monetary policy. That's what really is the sort of primary sort of focus around this. Th there's another interesting thing that I think uh, will start to have a bit more of an impact uh, in terms of the sort of permanent elements of inflation. So, for example, if you look at the housing market in the U.S., there is a significant shortage of what the Americans call starter homes, what here in Australia we took look at as sort of um, new build homes for young families. Uh, in the next decade, America will need to build three million more homes for those, uh, for people in that demographic than the previous decade. And the reason for that is that there is a bit of a bulge of people moving into that sort of 34, 35 year old uh, age group, which is when people start having families and, and want to start buying their first homes. And uh, three million more homes is a significant amount of construction. Mm. And some th that I think will probably lead to some more permanent pressures in things like building materials, um, lumber, uh, and those type of things. I'm a few more people living with mum and dad for a bit longer as yes. well. 
Is there any chance that bond prices aren't accurately <coughs> reflecting inflation risk? I think that's one of the things that investors are really grappling with at the moment. Mm. Um, you've seen, not just here in Australia, but particularly in the US, some quite dramatic moves in bond prices uh, in the last sort of six or seven months. It's interesting that um, investors, or a lot of people tend to ignore what's going on in bond markets because it's sort of covered in sort of arcane language and <laughs> it's a bit difficult to sort of follow. If you had seen the same moves in equity markets that we'd seen in bond markets, it would be front page news, it would be on the seven o'clock news every night. Um, because it's been happening in fixed income markets, people have uh, perhaps ignored it. Um, but you have seen the, US ten the yield on the US 10-year go from uh, around about 1% to nearly 1.7% and now back to about 1.4%, all in the space of the last five months. Um, and I think that's probably indicative of the fact that um, markets are trying to work out how much uh, inflation risk has already been discounted by markets, but also what those risks will be um, going forward. And I think that that sort of has been something that we've been very focused on at MLC, partly because it's, qu it's very difficult to be precise about how things are going to play out, but also because we're coming off um, you know, a period of sort of unprecedented um, economic inactivity because mm. governments shut down economies. And so how... I think people have been surprised at how rapidly economies have picked up steam, both here in Australia but also elsewhere too. What do you think will happen when the Federal Reserve starts tapering their bond purchases? A really good question and probably the $64 million question that's in, 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 in a number of investors' minds. In, in the first instance, I think obviously uh, just the sort of sheer impact that the Federal Reserve is having in different parts of sort of fixed in income markets as a sort of buyer of last resort, that obviously starts sort of moving back. One of the first impacts will be the removal of liquidity from, from those sort of markets. It, it's perfectly possible that that sort of removal of liquidity then has some impacts in other capital markets, particularly equities. And depending on how um, how that tapering is done, over what sort of time period and how aggressively the Fed moves, it's possible that that reintroduces some real volatility back into not just fixed income markets but equity markets as well. And I think that that's why you're seeing the Federal Reserve in its public comments being very careful about the language that it uses in terms of um, talking about time frames but also the quantum of uh, removing the sort of stimulus um, that it's had within capital markets because it has been an incredibly important driver to uh, equity markets and fixed income market prices rebounding so strongly since March last year. You mentioned it just before, kind of this volatility that we've seen in bond markets. I, f I also read a note that you, um, MLC is moving away from government bonds at the moment. Government bonds were traditionally seen as the risk-free asset class if government bonds are kind of too volatile now and then cash is also risky, what is the new risk-free asset class for investors? I think, I think the first thing to say is that our views about fixed income markets and particularly government bonds are, uh, are not particularly new and they actually predate, um, uh, predate the pandemic where we felt that yields were incredibly low mm. and that investors um, could find much more attractive investments, whether or not it was other parts of fixed income or equities or even some unlisted assets as well. And obviously, as bond yields have come down because you've had this extraordinary intervention by central banks, um, that view hasn't sort of really changed. Um, somebody uh, coined this sort of term, uh, return-free risk, <laughs> in terms of looking at, uh, at government bonds. And it's worth reminding people that um, you go to sort of German uh, fixed income markets, the German Bund, 10-year Bund, is still providing a negative yield. That's not something that any of us were taught in sort of um, economics at school or university. So I think um, that's one of the reasons why we felt that the risks uh, within parts of the fixed income market 
were just weren't that attractive, or the risk reward trade off wasn't that attractive. Um, I, I think I think it's important to remember that actually no investment is risk free. <laughs> Government bonds have never been uh, completely risk free. Um, so I think it's uh, we don't necessarily think about we're looking for something else to replace um, something that we think is riskless. Um, all investments have some element of risk to it. I think that where we sort of see uh, opportunities now are probably quite different from where they were sort of two or three years ago. Different parts of the fixed income market, um, for example, credit. Um, different parts of equity markets are probably more attractive now than uh, uh, than others. Let's talk a little bit more about that. How are you actually allocating capital at the moment? So I think we've got this um, idea of participating and protect and what that really means is that we think that um, the sort of very strong economic rebound that uh, we're seeing right now is likely likely to continue um, first of all you know as economies still move back to more normal trajectories um, uh, and you know we're seeing obviously um, continued challenges in parts of uh, parts of the economy here in Australia um, you know, we are seeing um, state governments continue to impose restrictions on economic activity, um, and that's disruptive to uh, a sort of general recovery. And you're seeing similar sort of things play out in, in other economies. Actually, we think that there's probably sort of still some quite strong um, momentum in more cyclical parts of, uh, parts of the economy. And that tends to sort of benefit things like equities, um, but we are also very cognizant as investors that by any standards valuations look pretty full, mm. both in equities, parts of the fixed income market, um, real estate markets, particularly sort of residential markets, um, given the sort of price rises you've seen and also the fact that interest rates remain incredibly low, that it is actually very cheap to borrow. Because we're cognizant of those valuation issues, we want to make sure that it may well be that we're sort of wrong in certain areas. So where we can add some protection into our portfolios, particularly in areas like equities, uh, that we do that. And we tend to uh, do that protection by buying derivatives, which means that we'll limit the downside if you do see a pullback in equity markets. Um, you manage MLC's multi-asset portfolios. Do you still use that kind of 60-40 model or how are you allocating in terms of defensives and growth? So I think that um, the first thing is that we've got a, a wide variety of different sort of products, um, some of which are still uh, measured against 60-40 benchmarks, that's equities against sort of growth and defensive. Mm -hmm. um, I think those traditional labels of what is a growth uh, element and, and what is a defensive element have actually been slightly turned on, our, turned on their head, particularly the more defensive things we were asking a question earlier about fixed income markets or sort of fixed income instruments and some of those are just not as defensive as we were all taught at, <laughs> uh, you know, at, at school and at university. And so I think some of those traditional labels are probably uh, uh, less useful going forward. Having said that, we have uh, products out of the marketplace and we need to make sure that they remain very much sort of true to label. But I think that some of that um, those sort of traditional uh, mixes of sort of growth and defensive equities may not be the right ones to help uh, investors achieve their financial outcomes in the way that uh, they might have done in the past. Mm. Let's talk a little bit more about equities. Many of the world's major indices are reaching new highs, but you wrote recently that earnings have actually fallen. Is there any turmoil underneath that investors should be aware of? I think what, one of the things you're seeing at the moment is that uh, research analysts are playing catch up with um, uh, what's actually going on in, uh, in earnings. And I think you sort of normally see this when you've had a significant period of economic disruption that people actually underestimate quite how quickly earnings can recover. Um, and we're certainly sort of seeing that again. And so you're seeing companies still... Uh, talking about earnings um, or reporting earnings that are sort of still quite backward looking. And that's one of the reasons why we think that that sort of cyclical upturn 
in earnings for uh, more economically sensitive companies has probably still got a bit further to go. Um, there are some firms where, which have been very much beneficiaries of um, lockdown, certainly some tech companies, um, you know, the companies that have provide all, um, all the sort of audio visual for us to be able to sort of work from home. Um, it's, been a, um, it's been a bit of a golden period for them. <laughs> Do we think that that sort of rate of growth from the earnings from those companies is sustainable? Probably not. Um, that doesn't mean that they won't continue to grow, but perhaps the pace of growth uh, will sort of slow down. So I think that that's something that we're sort of paying quite a bit of attention to. So, you know, where are uh, there still, um, particularly in equities, where are there still real opportunities for that earnings growth to come through very strongly and where it's probably not been properly discounted in current prices? You've spoken a little bit about the upside for cyclical companies and also um, various types of credit products. Are there any other areas where you're seeing opportunity at the moment and also on the other side of that risk? Yeah, so w one of the areas where we do continue to see sort of attractive returns are in uh, private markets, particularly private equity. Um, and that's uh, partly because um, you're sort of seeing a more sort of cyclical companies uh, come through in terms of much better profits uh, uh, than they had in the last sort of 12, 12 or 18 months. And there are a lot of very interesting companies which still remain private um, in areas like technology and healthcare, um, which you can't necessarily easily access through public markets and through sort of normal equity indices. And we continue to see um, parts of that sort of private equity area uh, remaining uh, very attractive to us where um, you've got businesses which are growing, um, growing strongly. They're in parts of the market where you're sort of seeing strong structural growth um, and where those sort of valuations um, are still playing catch up to a certain extent with, uh, with public markets. And so we continue to sort of see that as uh, an interesting area to, to invest in. And then there are other parts of the credit market, um, particularly what we might refer to as uh, private credit, where effectively you are, uh, are acting as a lender to, to companies, but for relatively sort of short term, uh, short time periods, perhaps sort of 18 to 36 months. Um, and some of that lending is in areas where um, banks or some of those sort of traditional lenders probably aren't able to or don't want to provide the finance. And so we found that uh, a particularly sort of interesting area. The returns there are quite interesting competition is a bit less. Um, Sounds quite risky though. I think it's like any investment, it's all about um, your underwriting. So making sure that you fully understand the business that you're backing. And you know, when we are looking at providing finance to those companies, um, first of all, it's for relatively short periods of time. We feel that we're doing it with significant amounts of protection. Um, and um, over the last sort of four or five years, in different economic conditions, um, that's actually been a pretty interesting part of the sort of portfolio to add value to, uh, to our investors. We asked you to bring a surprising stat with you today. <laughs> what have you brought for us? Well, I think the one that I sort of mentioned a little bit earlier about the fact that there are going to be three million more homes for young Americans built in the next decade. And the rough, that, what that really means is that I think at the moment there are about 40,000 homes in that area being built per year. America needs about 175,000 of them. Um, now, in an Australian context, that sounds sort of slightly mind-boggling. Mm. Um, but I think that, that that is one of the things that I think is very interesting. And the reason why I... I would sort of bring it to people's attention is it's just a reminder that demographics remain really important. That actually this is driven um, primarily because there is a bulge in the American population of that age group. Mm. And in the next decade, those are all people who are going to be looking for accommodation. Um, and so uh, those are the sort of things that I think um, help drive capital markets over the medium to longer term. 
We've talked a lot about markets today. Let's talk a little bit about the mentors and experiences that have helped shape your investment philosophy. Does anything stand out over your career? There are probably a couple of things which have sort of helped sort of navigate uh, the last sort of 15 or 16 months. Um, I'm probably going to uh, give away my uh, age, but when I first started working was actually the time for the last bond bear market and I was just starting out in my career um, and it was a it was a very tough learning experience but I think um, primarily because actually at the time I didn't really understand what was going on but it showed you I think the real power of bond markets and how they influence um, other other parts of uh, capital markets. I think some of the other things that have sort of uh, I, I've experienced in my career have helped me understand that you should expect the unexpected. Mm. Um, uh, in my mid to late twenties, I was investing uh, in in Asia, um, and uh, some people may remember that as part of the Asian financial crisis, a couple of governments imposed capital controls. Now that's sort of something that I think most people think are sort of confined to history books, but the idea that you could have your investments completely frozen and actually you cannot access them. Mm. It makes you sort of think about really the unthinkable um, and that sort of feeds back a little bit into the way that we think about sort of portfolio construction and the scenario process is it isn't just about the things that we would like to happen in markets but actually it's about the things that could happen. So um, those are sort of things you know, we're all sort of formed by our own experiences but I think that that sort of probably helped uh, I was, so it sort of conditioned me to expect the unexpected. It's been a crazy 18 months. Is there any advice that you could give to investors so that they can better invest over the coming 12 months? I think the advice is that you should seek advice. <laughs> I think that that is, I think one of the things that uh, this, is, this sort of period has reinforced is wow. that actually having sort of uh, strong um, and professional uh, financial advice is incredibly important. Um, each individual is unique in terms of their requirements, their sort of tolerance for risk, but it's also sort of helping navigate which, uh, you know, through a period which I hope very much will be unprecedented. Um, but I think it's probably sort of thrown up uh, a whole lot of sort of questions in a number of investors' uh, minds in terms of, you know, what, what they, how they need to position their portfolios going forward. Um, and particularly at a time when uh, returns from fixed income markets and, and, and cash is just so unbelievably low. Mm. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan. It's been a pleasure to talk to you today. Thank you very much.